Hey, buddy. What's happening? How are you? I want to talk about fasting. Fasting? <laughs> I, I fast. Okay. Daily. Daily. I do, uh, I do you f- wait, wait. You fast daily. Fast daily. Okay. Tell me more. Intermittent. Okay. Fast. I thought fasting was a not a daily activity. Could be. Well, it can be. Inter- intermittently, it can be. Okay. Oh, well, some people fast so, for days so at a time. How does this work? Uh, I do a 16-8. So I stop eating by 8 at night. And then I don't eat again until noon or one. What does that do for oh, you? Oh, 16, 16 hours not eating. Uh-huh. Eight hours eating in a day. It's my mm-hmm. eating window. How does that How does that work for you? What, you, what does it do? For me, inc- man, I've had increased energy, mm. increased mental clarity. Yeah. There's some reasons for that because of my diet and these things called ketones, which we'll probably talk about later. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, just it's, it's. I figured it would be hurting. It would hurt my energy, and it would hurt my clarity. But it's really peaked it. And like now, I don't, uh, I don't move from meal to meal. Mm-hmm. I don't worry about my meal so much. It's been kind of liberating. How, how do you get hungry? Yeah, I get hungry. Huh, and you just power through it. Yeah. Uh, oh, you mean during the fasting window? Yeah. Typically, no. If if I'm really hungry, I listen to my body. So mm-hmm. if I'm really hungry, I just eat. Interesting. Like, there's not a rule like you can't eat. You're yeah, in yeah, your yeah. fasting window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if yeah, if my body says eat, I eat. Huh. Do you drink water during that window? Yes. Good. I drink water, apple cider vinegar, mm. um, tea. I would drink tea, and uh, what else? Mm. Yeah, that's pretty much that's all. Fascinating. I have. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Things Rodney does that Keith won't try. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we should rename this section. <laughs> Welcome to, or welcome back to, More In Common. This is our social experiment. See, everyone has a story that can help us learn from one another. And we bring people into this safe space that we have learned to create so we can learn about their stories and get into difficult topics that challenge us in conversation and ultimately how we think. And we have a lot of these conversations and we're seeing a lot of similar threads through all of them. So what we're doing is breaking down these conversations to create a set of tools and a map that will help you become a conversation boss so that you can be a catalyst for conversation in your day-to-day life. And, and of course, don't forget www.moreincommonpod.com. Um, it's where you can find all things more in common related to us. And you can check out our blogs from the past. You can check out our podcasts and all things. And of course, if you're feeling up to it and you want to you wanna share it, please, you know, go ahead. Share the website. Share the pod from your favorite podcast app. Feel free to write us a review if you want. Let us know what we're doing well that you like. And, and we always accept constructive feedback if there's something that you think we should be doing better. So, um, again, moreincommonpod.com. Check us out. Um, now, we had an episode. We're coming out of one with R. Kyle Lynn Floyd. What would what, what, you take away from that one, Rob? Oh, R. Her willingness to share her journey because she she got she opened the the the, the veil uh to the stuff she's dealt with in her family and stuff she's dealing with and all that kind of stuff for us and that is um not easy to do and the peace that she's found with like herself and everybody like she's not uh if she harbor it doesn't seem that she harbors resent or anger not that she can't feel them but she's in a peaceful place and she's trying to help other people get to that peaceful place and it's just um just really and she's such a like i want to say enigma like she's just she's done so much and she's so young and Mm -hmm. she's so talented and sitting in the room with her you get an energy like it's this calm but like electric i don't know it's hard to explain but she's Mm -hmm. uh I, i took a lot out of the episode and i'm and as I listen back to it, I'm probably going to get even more. What about you? Um, yeah, I mean, in line, I didn't it, it, with generational trauma. Like when we first talked to her about it, that was really the first time I we had had a conversation 
Um, and since then, it seems to be a consistent theme of conversation that we have. But one of the things, like, you hear her talk about her family and, you know, you kind of feel this relation to it, right? Like, hey, we all kind of have these, this dirty laundry sometimes that we need to throw out. But the way she comes out of it at the end of that episode, talking about generational gems and the things that she, she maintains this balance of work and positivity at the same time. I think it's just really awesome because then you're like, oh, yeah, like there's, there's a light here. And there's a moment in the episode where she's talking about her experience in high school and, you know, she mentions our podcast of how, you know, the name of the podcast is more in common, but she didn't feel like she had anything in common with anybody for a period of time. And I think that's something, you know, maybe, you know, I don't think about often is like, we all do have more in common, but at the same time, sometimes we have to dig a little deeper to find it. Right. Well, um, and I don't know if she didn't feel that she didn't have anything in common. She, cause she had friends. Yeah. But, but she, she wasn't, she didn't connect with them on like a cultural level. She, right. she, and she said, she's even say connected with many of them, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I feel you. Yeah. So, um, now, who do we have this week? Nick Jones Jr. Uh, Nick Jones Jr., he's a, he served in the United States Marine Corps before leaving to pursue a career in the film industry. I mean, because that's a natural step, right? Like, you're, you're a Marine, and then you go become a writer. <laughs> and, like, that's how you do it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, he started his career as an actor. Before long, he was itching to create the worlds he helped bring to life on the screen. And he studied filmmaking at New York Film Academy where he learned to write and direct. He interned on the ABC comedy The Middle as a director, learning from the show's main director, Lee Shalit Shamel. And I believe, I'm pretty sure I've seen photos of him. He acted on that in that show as well. Mm. And he later became a mentee of feature film director Ditto Montiel and recently worked with him on his latest film, Man Down, which was starring Shia LaBeouf. Just do it <laughs> and Gary Oldman as the film's military consultant. So um yeah, that's uh that's our guest today, Mr. Mr. Jones Jr. What do we what do we talk about? Well, we talk about how if you look him up, it's Nick Jones Jr. Please Don't include that Jr. Junior. Um and if you want to know why, look up Nick Jones and you'll find out. Um but it's not the same person. You know, we talk right. about his life as a as a black marine and, you know, his perspective on Colin Kaepernick, right? We talk about his family history that led to well, was part of him entering into the Marines, growing up in Alabama. We talk about his new project, Dice K, um, that he's working on for Netflix that'll be coming out soon. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, we talk about a lot of things and, and a, a fun relationship that he has with our former president, Barack Obama, which yeah, uh, you're going to want to hear that. You're going to want to hear that. So Isn't, ob- didn't they uh, didn't they announce the actor for uh, Yasuke? Yeah, uh, the, the main actor. Uh, it's a uh, yeah, they did. I believe Mr. Wakanda himself. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it is. Chadwick Bose. Yeah. So so what, what were your big Rodney observations for this for this episode? Man, like. The fact that the story isn't ever really over until it's over. Mm. Like, Nick's a Marine, and it's really easy to be like, oh, he's a Marine. He thinks this, and he thinks this about the flag and the country, and he thinks this about Hollywood and writing. And it's just like, no, he doesn't think what you think about any of that stuff. And also, he... His his like reinvention, like he's like reinvented himself, and he talks about his his work ethic and how he's used it to become this this really successful writer, and um, like he's super stoic as well, but like just I don't know, stoic and chill. Those are my observations. That's a lot of observations. <laughs> so I want you to go in, and I want you to just every single one of those. I just want want you to just notice them. <laughs> All right what about Um, you conversation tips yeah i think one is clarifying questions like don't be afraid to ever ask and we have to do that a few times i have to do that a few times in this episode as i just didn't understand certain things that he was trying to say and check in with yourself like this is something we haven't really talked about before but there's a moment um when we talk about his fight in the boot camp and his 
perception of some people within the within the unit and like there's a moment of check-in like okay are we going to continue where are we going and, it, and it's just a good moment of reflection in a conversation so you can continue moving forward and 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 just have a, a great connection and rest of the communication so um yeah that's what i got so nick jones jr enjoy it get it say for example you know places that are being like gentrified and stuff and you know white people are moving in and if you're like black trying to move in you know i've i've been i've been pushed out or not pushed out but like blocked from getting into a home that you know a white person bought and flipped because they were trying to fill it with a white person and so it's just like yo like all right i like this place da, 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 da. For no reason it's just like they try to find whatever reason to disqualify you then they don't just and then you, you have all your shit together you're not disqualified but it's just like eh. You know, and then you got the real you coming back to you like, well, you know, they just, uh, they weren't comfortable with, you know, whatever, but you know, can, can you put down like an absurd amount of money, right? It's just like, <laughs> can, you, can, can you put, they, they, so this, they literally asked me if I could put down the, the entire first year. I'm like, what the, like, who puts down the entire first year? Like, what are you talking? No, like, why? Nick Jones. Nick, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How you doing? Doing well. Thanks for joining us. All right. Off the top. Well, actually, I got, you know what? I got I to stay it's, uh, Nick Jones Jr. because there's another Nick Jones. And oh, I that's right. Separate, I got to separate yeah. myself. Because, you know, he's got yeah. some bad stuff out. Nick Jones yes. Jr. Nick yeah. Jones Jr. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You definitely have to run that, that search with the junior at the end. Yeah. Add yeah. The junior. So my question off the top. I happen to know that you're a Marine. Actually, looking at you right now, you're wearing a USMC hat, and yeah. I see a flag yeah. behind you. Yeah. So my first question, I wanted to ask you this when I first met you, but I didn't have time. How do you feel about, like, the, the anthem protests? Support. Like, what is that? What's that? I support it. You support it? 100%. What? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go keep going. <laughs> no, 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 no. You say you support it, so... Is there is there any any inner conflict or strife? I mean, you're a proud Marine. I, I I'm I'm picking up that you're a proud Marine because I'm watching you right now. But like, what is is it is it just that that cut and dry for you? you support it? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a black man first, you know. Like, I love the core, but uh, it, people tend to forget that the the guy who told Kaepernick to kneel was an Army Ranger. Yep. And so, you know, he was like, "Yo, this is what you can do." that doesn't show disrespect or anything to the troops, you mm -hmm. know, which is take a knee, which is something that we do a lot. For fallen um, soldiers. Yeah, fallen, for, uh, fallen comrades and stuff. So um, for me, I, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no conflict of, of interest or anything, like, you know, because I, I understand the things that, they're, that they are um, protesting because I've lived it, I continue to live it, and um, there needs to be some change. How do you feel about the conflict associated with the protest itself? It's it's political. It, it's all it is is you know political noise, and you know I hate when you know stuff like that kind of gets you know blown out of proportion for someone's political agenda. Mm. So I just I wanted to ask that just because it was it was t like when I walked in I was just like oh this is a black marine so I got to ask him. I just, I, that, I, I think it's, you know, it's, <laughs> but it's one of those things like, you know, you, I, a lot of times when you're on social media, in my personal experience, that is, you see people who have had, who, who are on the other side of that position around right. the protest themselves. They either didn't serve, um, or they just have a family member that serves, right? Like, so it's not, 
it's not a personal experience. It's, it's a, some associated experience. And then you see those, you know, especially, you know, black men who are against it used for that opinion. And like, I just, I personally get a little tired of the argument on the protests. Like, okay, you like it or you don't like it. That's fine. But can we talk about what they're protesting and actually what really matters? Right. Like, yeah. To your point, yeah, about politicizing it and being a black man first. You know, it, it, it bothers me. It bothers me when um, the cops and the, when the state troopers can, can protect, you know, a KKK rally or when those cats are like, you know, storming somebody's Capitol Hill or, or you know, or whatever. And but yet it, everyone's like outcrying when a black man takes a knee on a football field. Mm. Like, how, how, how does that work? You know, like. And, and especially when it comes to, you know, being a Marine and being in the service and stuff, it's just, you know, we're supposed to be fighting for, you know, all of these rights and freedoms of speech and things like that. So, all right, if, if, if I'm fighting for, you know, you know, was it Bill Duke? That's his name. If, if I'm fighting for like, fucking, David, oh, hey, Duke. Duke. Dave, David Duke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm, if I'm fighting for David Duke's ass to, to fucking say what he wants to say, then then fuck yeah, I'm, that means I'm fighting for, you know, Kaepernick to, to be able to take a knee, you know, and I'm not fighting for fucking David Duke. Like, what kind of I think from now on I'm calling him Bill Duke, though. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Predator is my favorite movie, so, like, you know, Bill Duke is just, like, the first Duke that comes in my name. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry, Bill Duke. Uh, you know, that's a legend right there. Uh, but, yeah, man, so, it, you know, it just bothers me when, like, nobody has anything to say when, you know you know, these, these quote unquote white nationalists, which is just a new fucking way of them trying to rebrand the whole KKK. Like all it is. Shit. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it, it's okay for, for them to kind of like have their rallies and shit and all this other stuff. And then, you know, you got motherfuckers out here telling us, some, Oh, you know, they were, they were bad people on both sides. And I'm like, what, what does that even mean, man? So yeah, I'm gonna get on the I tangent. Think- <laughs> no, I, I think that's, I mean, it's a point I hadn't heard before the idea of, I mean, I'm fighting for the American freedom, and that happens to encompass people who disrespect the flag by wearing it as underwear. I don't know if you wear it as underwear, but in the Constitution, it's technically defaming the flag, right? Oh, flag, the flag. Uh, um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, these you're still fighting for the likes of David Duke, even though you're not, because you know they're Americans. So why is why is there so much outcry over a man who kneels for equal rights instead of outcry over a man who fights for for subjugation and well, I mean, inequality right that's the, that's the yeah. heart of it though it's like because because the citizenship is not equal i want to know a little bit about nick jones jr and where he grew up man uh i was born in new jersey uh Voorhees, new jersey which is like south Voorhees, Voorhees, yeah like jason Voorhees. jason Voorhees, okay yeah camden county uh it's right across from philly um was there for about, uh, and from there we moved to like Newark and Somerville. And so I was in Jersey for about six years, and then my dad moved us all back to Alabama where he grew up at. And I was in Bama from, you know, six to uh, 19, and uh, until I joined the Marine Corps. Where, where in Bama? Uh, when we first got there, we were in a little small town called Shorter, uh, which is like run on the outskirts of Tuskegee. Um, and then <clears throat> I think when I was like 12, we moved to Montgomery, yeah. uh, which is the, you know, central, that's the state capital. I was so. just in, just in Montgomery a few months ago and went over to the, to the museum. Museum. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they had the, um, that's when they had like the, the grand opening, right? Yeah. Now, I went after the grand opening and it okay. turns out there, the, uh, the, the lynching exhibit, um, <laughs> is closed on Tuesdays and I was there on a Tuesday. Uh, so, uh, but you can see it from the street and you can, you still get, you still get it. Like, yeah, it, yeah. it's, it's still one of those things. I went there with a, a UK friend of mine of ours actually. And mm-hmm. he, he, like, even from the UK, it's like you explain to him what this was and yeah, it was, it was a moment. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, see, so I was there, you know, went to, you know, middle school, junior, uh, junior high, high school in, in Montgomery. And then uh, we did two years at uh, UAB, uh, 
played played up football at UAB in Birmingham. What uh, you what said we... so like nineteen then Marine. Do you have yeah. a military family? Um, I mean, I it's it's like peppered in. So kind of peppered in. My 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 dad's dad. He was in the army, served in World War II. My uh, and my dad's uncle was, um, which I'm very proud of. He was one of the Montfort Point Marines. Uh, so he was a part of the batch of first Black Marines that were um, brought into the Marine Corps when they first, uh, you know, um, desegregated the Marine Corps. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> so, that was, so that's my great uncle. Um, and so there's my, some legacy there. Yeah, some legacy there. Um, my my mom's dad, he was in the Air Force and uh, he served during uh, during the Korean conflict. And uh, my mom, she was in the Army Reserves for a little bit. Um, and I got a cousin who joined the uh, the Air National Guard. But yeah, nothing nothing like you know like concrete. But we, I got we got a few players here. Still there. a lot, a lot that's more a, than a, I have. Yeah, that's a lot. I got like grandparents. That's yeah, I'm to get. a lot more than I have. Now, what was it like for you growing up in Alabama? Oh man, it was lots of mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> mosquitoes love my black behind. Man, like you I know, too. my my folks used to joke because you know I was I was like the you know the Yankee kid that came down, so they was like, oh, you got that sweet blood, you know, you got that Jersey blood, that's why they keep biting you. Um, but yeah, you know, it was it was cool. You know, when we first got there, uh, I lived with um, we lived with our with our grandparents. Um, my dad's, my dad's folks, and then you know we finally was able to get on our feet. Um, my dad, he uh, was a logger, so he cut down trees, and so most of my summers until <clears throat> maybe like high school, I, I was spent, um, you know, in, in in the woods. And my dad cut trees down. That was like my summer job. So um, it was very blue collar, very, very, uh, just like you know grindy grindy life you know mm. obviously he was he was uh you know he was he was a hard worker so i i kind of get a lot of my you know inspiration from him just knowing how much he you know did and sacrificed to kind of you know help me have a good education and uh and get me out of it so it's uh when you ask that question keith like i can't i have family in bama i've been in bama a lot in my life every time i hear somebody talk about growing up in alabama the first thing my head goes to is like racist. How racist was your experience growing up there? Mm-hmm. Like oh. that's the first thing my head, <laughs> and like and I've never even actually other than seeing Confederate flags on people's trucks, I've never had a personal racist experience when I visited. Mm. But it's still the first thing that comes up in my head. But, but it's one of those funny things of you know associated with gaining personal experience versus understanding the national narrative of wherever you may be because i i do the same thing and your first answer was mosquitoes right like yeah. it's not and then at no point <laughs> hateful did you tell us and then it's your dad being a logger like your experience regardless of what happened like that's that's your life but then you know i've seen i've gone to california you know and seen m- plenty of confederate flags there but we don't think of california that way or the same way in our prior episodes when we've talked about boston like boston's the northeast but boston's one of the most racist places you know that that have existed especially over the last hundred years so it's funny as you know we try to break down a lot of these stereotypes because i think there's a demographic stereotype that we have, a regional stereotype that we have, and I think I, mean, I, I love the answer, man. I'm sure it wasn't easy all the time. Oh, but. I mean, and look, and, and that racism, I mean, it exists. And I mean, by no means am I saying that I did not have, you nope. know, experiences of racism. Um, I just, you know, it's I, I tend to kind of like focus in on on the family aspect and you know the good times and stuff. But no, I mean, I, I would say when you're when you're around people that you know because like every everyone isn't racist so it's not like you know you're coming back there and it's like you know 1920s alabama and it's just Mm -hmm. like oh you know but um but there's pockets of it to where it's like if you're not necessarily like the wrong part of town but you know if you're growing up in an area white people there that know you in the area and they grow up around black people things like that like everybody's cool everybody's fine um but there are times when it's just like you know you need to run across some cats that, you know, they just live off to themselves somewhere. 
and either they're not, you know, I, I would just say that you you feel the tension at certain times with certain people, mm. but it's it's not everybody. And I've had like some some moments. I remember when I was a kid, uh, I was probably like 12, 13 or something like that. But so the rule was I had to be home before the before the street lights came on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one, one, one night I was running late. And because, you know, we was out playing basketball and stuff, uh, you know, we had to you know, roll the roll the, the gold back into the driveway and everything. And, and, the, and the kid, uh, Sean Swayze, we used to play at his house. Uh, he lived in a cul-de-sac. But, um, but yeah, so I was riding back. And um, there is this like this because a lot of uh, a lot of the pickup trucks uh, in Bama and in the south, so they go mud. And so like they raise them up and stuff. So like this big ass like thing is like a Ford F-150 or something like that. Um, kind of like was barreling down the road and then they drove right past me, like going the same direction that I was going. And so, um, you know, I didn't see it when, it, when they were doing it, but they had a box of chicken, like, like, you know, that they had already eaten and stuff. And they just threw it out the window and they said, get out the neighborhood nigger and fucking like threw the box of chicken at me and just, you know, barrel down the road laughing and shit. So, I mean, that's, that's probably, you know, one of my more like, um, the memories that kind of come back of just like you know, blatant racism and, you know, and you get the stuff of like, you know, whether it's like security, like mall cops and, and, um, you know, police officers here and there, I think there was like a couple of state troopers that kind of ran across where it's just like, okay, you just stopped me cause I'm black. Um, but, but how, yeah, do you, so. how do you explain? So my, my wife, my wife is white. And one time we were talking about stuff like that between me and my brother and little things where we're like, I'm pretty sure that happened because I was black. And mm-hmm. she was like, how do you know? And like I at that in that moment I can't I don't know I don't have the words to articulate it but it's like yeah. I I know that that's why that just happened. How, do you have a way to articulate it? Uh, I mean if they if that, that that's the word right there. It's like if they can't articulate to you, you know, uh, a a reason to why oh, they yeah, 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 yeah. You know, why they're pulling you over. It's like hey, you know, you know why'd you pull me over, officer? You know, normally it's like, oh, you were speeding or you ran or you rolled through this stop sign or, you know, whatever the case may be. If they don't answer that question, you know, at a certain point, you're still being respectful and everything. And they have nothing to do, but they just like they're literally just like checking everything to see if they can find a problem. That's when you know, it's, you know, to, you know, easy because it's just like plenty of times where I'm, you know, I'm pulled over. They won't tell me what they pulled me over for or you know or it's like mm. clearly a lie where it's just like no i stopped at the stop sign i wasn't speeding whatever the case Tail lights be. busted out boy yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um you know or, or i think i think they were like oh you didn't use a turn signal i was like no yeah i did like what are you talking about like i got this loud ass turning signal like you know like i used a turn signal it yeah no it's crazy and and even now it's just like you know like uh i would say for example you know places that are being like gentrified and stuff and you know white people are moving in and if you're like black trying to move in you know i've i've been i've been pushed out or not pushed out but like blocked from getting into a home that you know a white person bought and flipped because they were trying to fill it with a white person and so it's just like yo like all right i like this place da, 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 da. For no reason it's just like they try to find whatever reason to disqualify you then they don't just, and then you, you have it, all your shit together. You're not disqualified, but it's just like, eh, you know. And then you got the real issue coming back to you, like, well, you know, they just uh, they weren't comfortable with, you know, whatever. But you know, can can you put down like an absurd amount of money, right? It's just like, can you put, can, can you put? It, it, so this is they literally asked me if I could put down the the entire first year. I'm like, what the like? Who puts down the entire first year? Like, what are you talking? No, like, why? <laughs> where, where where was that? Uh, it's, uh, um, damn. What, what was yeah, it in um, California? Oh yeah, no, it was California. Oh, um, that's like a, that's like a down payment Bald- on a, on a house. On a like, home. Like, um, like, it, was, it was, uh, was it Baldwin Hills or Windsor Hills? View Park. No, my bad. It was View Park. We were trying to, uh, get a spot in View Park, man. And it was just like, and like literally I, I drove back by the crib, you know, a couple weeks later, white family in there already moved in mm-hmm. chilling putting up the curtains i was like putting up the curtains putting up the curtains motherfuckers man so um mm-hmm. well so you went so so did you choose to go into the marine corps because your family or like uh, was, was there it, a personal choice it, it was a personal choice uh it was a couple different factors um so 
I had this girlfriend that I was skipping class and skipping practice to go see. She went to uh, U of A, uh, University of Alabama. My grades weren't good. And I was just kind of like losing that, that, you know, that football spirit and stuff. So, um, and so I was like on the verge of like being kicked out of school. I didn't want to go back home to Montgomery because I was just kind of like, man, like if I go back here, then, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to seem like a failure because I was like, oh shit, like I fell out of school. I'm gonna go back home. Everybody's gonna know. Like, oh, why are you back here? Like, oh, you didn't make it. And, and the thing, and the biggest thing was my dad. He he wanted me to go to a junior college first before going to you know like a like a four year school that that UAB was. And the reason why, because he was just like you know go to a, go to a, uh, go to like a junior college first, get your grades, you know, kind of like transition into it, then go to the four year college, you know, get your degree, you know, get the get the bachelor's. And I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So when I was like failing out, I was like, fuck, man. Like, I can't. I can't right. I, done <laughs> I, can't, that I can't tell him that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I can't go back. So uh, I signed up. You know, so my, 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 uh, girl, my girlfriend at the time, she had just joined the Army that summer prior. And I was just like, man, you know what? I'm going to join the military, but I got to do something harder than you. Um, <laughs> it was like a little competition with her. Because she. I remember when she came back, she was talking about all of this, like, you know, my battle buddy this and my battle buddy that. I'm just like, man, what? Huh? And then it was just like, you know, and, and you know, we're doing all of this training and I got to shoot this. I was like, all right, like that doesn't sound too, that sounds kind of fluffy. I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go a little bit harder than that. Um, not calling the army fluffy. Just want to make that, you know, make that clear. You know, it's just, just the way that, your, your perception before you were. Yeah, 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 yeah. My perception from her when she came, yeah. from, my, from my ex who, when she came back, it was just kind of like, eh, so, you know. But uh, so yes, yeah, so I joined joined the Marines, and uh, I remember when I first went into the to the uh, recruiting office, they kind of um, they uh, they didn't believe me because they're just like, okay, I, mo- you know, it, it's hard for them enough to like try and find like you know uh, eligible applicants to kind of like get in and stuff, and so I was just like, no, nah, like I'm here, like let's do it, and so and I was like too adamant about like coming in that they they kind of didn't believe me. So like the first recruiter I, I talked to, he like passed me off to like one of the junior recruiters because he was just like, yeah, this kid's not for real. And then, <laughs> but uh, but then they found out like, oh shit, like he is for real, you know? Because they're like, oh, what are you doing? Like you play college football and all those shit. Like you know, same for you. Um, so I was like, nah, like I'm, I'm here, to, I'm here to stay, and uh, you know, shipped out. And my dad was pissed. I remember I told him. Uh, that I signed up, he punched me in the chest. Um, yeah, really? He, but he punched he punched me in the chest because I I I got smart with him though because he was because mm-hmm. um, he had he had like his thing against like you know you know Uncle Sam and stuff like that. So and, and just growing up without civil rights, so like he has like his own you know stench towards it all. And um, I remember when we were coming back from church, and um, I told him I was just like, yeah, you know, like I, I'm. I'm you know, I think about like joining the military and uh, joining the Marine Corps, and he went on this whole tangent about like you're playing Russian roulette with your life. I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that. Said I was playing Russian roulette with my life, and if I go, then you know I could die and all this other stuff. And why are you gonna put your life in line for all this crap? And yada yada yada. Um, Bush was the president at the time, so obviously he had like his thoughts and stuff on that. And Bush, Bush one or Bush two? Uh, Bush two. I ain't that old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dang, it's a good which, level what? set. It's a good level set. Uh, <laughs> um, what was I gonna say? Um, but yeah, so like you know, I, w- I was telling him all this, and you know, and so then he was just like, "No, like you know, you can't do it." Blah blah blah. And I was like, "Well, no, I can. I mean, I'm I'm over 18. Like I can, I can sign up." And he was just like, "You ain't sign up on my watch." You know, all this other stuff. And I was like, "Well, I mean, I I kind of already did it. Like, because you know, I told him after I signed up." Yeah, right. I was like, well, I mean, you can't stop me. I, you are, I already signed up. And I said it like that. So, you know, came across the hammer fist. And I was like, oh, I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. how did how did he how did you guys reconcile that? Like, because it, it sounds like obviously he he has some deep seated. Uh, I mean, you talk uh, about I tell, feelings you know, about the man yeah, feelings. Thank you. Yeah. That's the word I was looking for. I mean, and a lot of that, com- a lot of that came from what what Rodney was talking about earlier, where you know it's it's that racism that I mean, he experienced a lot of racism coming up in Alabama. Yeah. It was a different time. Like I said, you know, when he was born, you know, he he didn't have civil rights. You know, um, and That's a, that is a thought right there. 
he mm-hmm. didn't have civil rights, you know. Like, no, I, I actually don't know what that's like. Like, that's. I mean, every it's, time it's I think about that, like that, is heavy. It's something yeah. we talk about. I mean, the idea that, I mean, we're a generation removed from it, and most of that generate a lot of that generation is still alive. That I mean, that generation is running shit. That's yeah. Like, and that's why we can't escape from it, because you know you, we we've got a we've got a fucking president that you know grew up where like you know he black people were his maids and shit, and it's just like and that was like the best job that we could get. Like he remembers that, you know, mm. when he he's what seventy, he is so, yeah yeah like think about when he was twenty years old. What where where were we at as a nation? When he was 20. You a grown so he, man at 20. So it would have been 1948. So he would have been, yeah, 19 years old when, when you know, Jim Crow was, was ended. Like 19, like his formative years were, yeah, were, Jim were and, and his dad was, was not a poor man. So, no. you know. Hmm. So, yeah. you know. You think about the things that were instilled in him. Think about the things that are instilled in you during those years, and think about the things that could have, you know, would have been and could have been instilled in him at that time. And then you look at that track record. Like I'm not surprised at any of this shit because of how he grew up, when he grew up, and everything that he's done with, you know, his life since then. So, so how'd you reconcile that with your dad? He, uh, you know. It started with letters, letters from uh, from boot camp. And mm. um, he was he was like my main pen pal, him, mm. him and my girlfriend at the time. And so we would, you know, I would just hit him up and tell him everything that was going. I probably wrote him like two or three letters a week. And, um, what, was it harder than what you heard her tell, talk about the army? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't expect him to say no. <laughs> but, nah, man, shoot. They, man, they don't pull no punches, figuratively and literally. I got in so many fights. Like, it, it, man, a lot of testosterone was boiling. I mean, you bring in all these cats from, like, all over the, all over the, uh, the U.S. And, man, we had, like, this, man, we had, like, this freaking, like, like, like swole, swole cat like that played canadian football mm. he was and i'm a pretty big dude but he was like three times my size and he and he was our guy um and and um and so like so the guides the person that kind of like leads the entire platoon and in, in, in boot camp so and you have like the squad leaders um and so like the guides like over the squad leaders the squad leaders are over the individual squads okay and um and i remember um you know, so they would fuck with you, but and 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 it's kind of like they purposely pick on you. And, and I didn't realize this like at the end when one of my drill instructors pulled me aside, uh, Cochran, and he was just like, "Yeah, he's like, you know, it's, it's just a game, Jones. You know what I'm saying? Like, we we fuck with you to kind of like you know get you mad so you can you know operate. And that's the whole thing. It's just like it, it's to stress you out because when you go to war, like you're gonna be fucking stressed out. So you got to be able to like think clearly, take orders, be around people that you don't like." And get the job done, even when you're stressed, even when they're on your last nerve, type thing. Because you know, no matter how, no matter how much like so and so may be like shitting on you in combat, like you got to do what so and so says, or everybody's gonna die. Mm-hmm. So you just you know, you got to kind of like detach from it and not make it personal. And and I kind of came in like I, I was an angry kid, so I, I kind of came in with like a lot of chips on my shoulders. So like I was taking everything personal, and uh, I had a rough time. So I was I was like getting a lot of fights, <laughs> and I remember I got in a fight with the guy because um, I'm not like a loud person. With the so, soul, with the big dude. Yeah, yeah, with the big dude, man. Mm-hmm. So like That's, I'm not. It sounds like a smart choice. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> it was it was a very smart choice on my on my end, but um, yeah, we uh, so what they do is like we go on the quarter deck and we got to like do you know for punishment like we'd have to do like these random exercises and stuff. Um, Especially like in the sand pit where they, where they had like these sand fleas, and they're basically like mosquitoes that live in the sand. Oh, that and sounds they're... horrible. And you but, and you, we've already determined you love mosquitoes. I know, right? But <laughs> but think think of think of these. If mosquitoes in the south are like fish in a pond, then the sand fleas are motherfucking piranhas. 
Uh, mm. They come at you in packs. It's like if you if you as soon as you step foot in like a pile of sand, these motherfuckers oh. like wrap up. Like uh, they just all over you. And you're doing work. You're doing exercises in that. Yeah, you gotta like do exercises in that. The motherfuckers they be like, all right, now stand in position of attention. All right, stand still. Oh all right, my god, they don't, gotta move. don't move. Don't move. Don't <laughs> move. They gotta eat too. <laughs> they gotta eat too. <laughs> Get back. I'm like what? <laughs> Get back. <laughs> hey. Circle, circle of life, life, guys. Circle of life. <laughs> so, come on, Simba. Uh, yeah. So, like, so we were doing some shit like that. I remember I was getting pissed off. They, you know, and, they, and so the whole thing is about they want you to get loud because you got to be loud in combat. You know, like shit's firing and stuff like that. Like you got to be able to project. Got to be able to talk loud. So, like, part of like the training was like to get you pissed off and to get you to scream to get you to yell. And I guess I wasn't getting loud enough for one of the drill instructors. So they was so they made like all of the fucking squad leaders, uh, myself included, like go through you know some dumb shit. In the sand, in the sand, uh, in the sand pit, and um, and I guess I still wasn't getting loud. And they're like, "Well, we gonna stay in here until Jones gets loud." And I guess I still, cause I, and I was mad, so I was just kind of like, I was purposely not like saying it, not saying it loud, like they wanted me to say it, cause I was like, "Man, fuck you." And the motherfucking guy got pissed, cause he was getting eaten alive by these sand fleas, and he fucking charged the shit out of me, and I. It, it was like one of the, it was like literally like testosterone on testosterone. It was like two big gorillas. He was just like, fucking get loud, Jones. And I was like, I'm not fucking loud enough for your ass. And then we just came at each other like fucking like just 200, like 400 pound gorillas. And we just smashed and we were just going at it. And the drills, they just stepped back and they just let us get to it. And then once I started winning, then that's when they started like fucking coming in. Yeah, I won. I won. And then they, they fucking came in, separated it. And then I'm the one that got fucking thrown into a damn chokehold. And I was like, man, some fucking bullshit. Mm. As, I have some thoughts about that, but anyway. I have some thoughts about that. <laughs> did you, eventually, that. Did you like, ever get loud enough for them? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I fell in love. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it helps somebody. It's, sand, it's those sand fleas. What, what, what are those thoughts? Uh, um, About, you know, just kind of like the chokehold. Oh, the chokehold? Oh. <laughs> I didn't like him anyway. I, I didn't, uh, a lot of people didn't like him, but, you know. It is what it is. Mm. He, uh, you know, yeah. No, no need to go there. Yeah, you know, bald, bald white guy. You know, so I, you know, there was like a perception that I had. I'm not here to say that he was or wasn't. Don't know, but you know, at the time, because you got to think about I me. Mean, it's, I mean, I was. It was heightened um, aggression. You know, mm-hmm. you got <clears throat> you got sixty people in a squad bay. You know packed in tight sleeping on top of each other showering together you know like it's bound to be some you know some 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 punches thrown and yeah some clashes and some, yeah some clashes and, and that's and that's including the drill instructors because i mean those like we weren't getting any sleep and those motherfuckers weren't getting any sleep either they was getting less sleep than we were getting so you know it is what it is mm. so you you served for 12 years yeah yeah, and then you moved to um, Hollywood to be a screenwriter. Like, yeah, what... um, it's so so. I served so act so that's active duty and reserve time kind of combined. So it was twelve okay. years total. I, I didn't get out till till uh, till April. So like this time last year, I, I was deployed, man. Like, I, I oh, to, for real? Yeah, yeah. This time last year, I was gone. Um, but yeah, but uh, and I'll get back to that, but. Um, yeah, uh, I started, um, so I, you know, I was taking theater and, and, and uh, theater arts and drama back in like high school and, and uh, my first couple of years in college at, at UAB. And um, so acting was kind of like the first love, the first thing that I really wanted to do. Oh. And, uh, you know, there, there was a time where I was just like, you know what, you know, because I, I, I was out here for a little bit back in like 06, 07 before like for some pre-deployment training. And, you know, I was trying to like figure out how to like do this acting thing. Couldn't figure it out. So I was just like, all right, you know what? I'm probably just going to do this military thing for 20 years and call it a day. And um, then I ended up, uh, you know, deployed, came back. I was in Hawaii for, um, you know, because I had attached to the unit there. And so I was in Hawaii, happening a couple weeks with uh, President Obama. And so that's what kind of changed everything. And, you sp- um, what is it? What do you, what do you wait? Mean, you a couple spent a Obama. couple weeks with President Obama. What? Yeah, he. Uh, so this was after this. This was after the election, before the inauguration, 
And um, and so we, I think we were like, it was like end of November, beginning of December, somewhere in there. And, you know, I was back and I, I was working like night shifts and stuff. So like during the day, like my days were free. So I would work out around like 10-ish, 10, you know, somewhere in there, I'd be at the gym. So one day, you know, I'm at the gym, just on, on the treadmill and stuff, getting it in, watching CNN, got my headphones in. Um, you know, like every, literally every news report was, you know, Obama. So I'm watching, you know, news reports on Obama, blah, 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 blah. And then I do a double take to my right and Obama is next to me on the trip <laughs> hopping on and, and he just like looks at me and I was like, oh, hey. And I'm like, huh? And then I'm like looking like, wait, what? what? And so I'm like, all right. So then I look around the whole gym, like they, they've cleared the gym out. So I guess I was like just so tuned out, like Casper just like cleared out. Michelle, she's in the corner doing curls. Secret Service there at a couple exits. So I'm just like, yo, what the fuck is how how is this happening? So I finished my run, and uh, and then I head out like I because you know I was just like, yo, like, oh my god, I'm next to you know President President Elect Obama, and um, so I go to the basketball court. So I'm in there shooting for a little bit, and I'm in there for about 15 20 minutes, and then like the doors bust open, Secret Service, they go to all the exits, and then like a few seconds later. Obama comes in, flanked by like two agents, and he's like, "Yo, mind if I shoot with you?" And I was like, "Uh, yeah." And so he started playing horse, and and then that kind of became the routine for like the next couple of weeks. And um, so we're doing that. And and why the- didn't they? Why didn't they ask you to like leave the gym? Because he's not. They the already guy. knew who he was and that he was a marine. He was good. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh you mean like me? Oh yeah, because yeah, yeah, the base, yeah, the gym was on base. Oh, it was on base. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Gotcha, Sorry, gotcha, yes. Yeah. Gotcha, so, gotcha. so the gym's okay. on base. So like everyone, you know, we're everyone's like checked out. We're good to go and things like that. Right, so right, right. And you know, and he, you know, he wasn't he ain't the type that's like, oh, everybody's got to clear out because like you know God is here. Like he, you know, he's just like a regular dude. So he just kind of was just like, all right, you know, they doing their thing. I'm gonna do my thing. And, and then we ended up playing ball and stuff. And then that led to uh, wait, wait, know, wait. Did you? Did you beat him at horse? And can and can you answer that question? Because <laughs> it will be public. <laughs> uh, he, he, he won. He, he won. He beat me. He beat me. I did not win. Every time? Yeah, every time. He, he won. He's got, a, he's got a good shot. Lucky lefty. Mm-hmm. He's good. So what was that? What was the... You said everything changed after that. Like... What, yeah, cause, what know, was he, the impact of that on you? I mean, because, you know, we, we would ball and we would talk and things like that. So, you know, for him, he's he's all about, I, I think it's just like inherent in him. Like, he's just all about mentoring mm. and stuff. And, and so he would ask me, like, you know, like what I wanted to do, you know, if I wanted to stay in, in the military for 20 years, like open my plans that I plan on going back to school, things like that. And, you know, I was just kind of like, well, you know, these these are the things I wanted to do. Like I wanted to act and you know, I wanted to like work in the industry and stuff, but you know, it's kind of impossible. Like I don't know anybody in it. Yada, yada, yada. And that's when he stops me and he's just like, yo, like I'm a black man about to become president. Like nothing's impossible. And you know, he just kind of like lays out a plan for me as far as like using my GI bill, which I wasn't really, you know, thinking about using. So, so I went to film school for free. So I ended up coming back once I got out uh, off active duty, I went to film school for free. Um, but you know, he talked to me about my, you know, benefits, GI bill, and just really just like not giving up on my dreams, you know, and, and hearing that it's one thing when you hear from like your folks or mm-hmm. your friends or a teacher or a guidance counselor, it's just like, okay, yeah, yeah whatever. You hear that yeah. shit from motherfucking Barack Obama, like you do it. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Damn, you should be hard right. pressed not to. Yeah. 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 So, um, and so, yeah, so that, that was like the message that, you know, he gave me and I was like, all right. And he kind of, he gave me like this blueprint and, and what I need to do. And I, and, and, and kind of go back to my dad. Um, so me and my dad, we, we went to the inauguration. Um, um, but I mean, I remember like my dad, it meant so much to him because he, you know, he was just like, yo, this is like, this is like your million man march. You know what I'm saying? Like for him to remember what it was like not to have those rights back in the day and to be there to see a black man become president and to kind of like see that realization on my dad's face means the world to me meant the world to me in that moment and 
for me to actually have like spent time and to get that type of, you know, tutelage from Barack Obama and then to see the impact that he had on my dad mm. just for being who he was. Man, like that. That's that's that amazing. Is, yeah, no, you used to have his number. Do you send him your uh, you send him your writings and be like, hey, can you can you proofread this? <laughs> I, I will. It, it is it is a crazy you know to think about you know because he's got that deal at Netflix now, um, and and you know and I'm writing a show for Netflix, so it's it's kind of cool, you know, to kind of like you know look at that, and be like, damn, like you know, I remember when I when I was just thinking about this and he was you know becoming president. And now we're both at Netflix, so oh. it's it's, it's kind of cool. It's just you know, Man. It's just oh, that's. A, I mean, certain. that that whole story with your dad, like that's that's real. Like, cool. It's it's a yeah. Given our work. current political climate, it is a uh, it's one of those reminders of what that actually meant, oh. right? Like, yeah. don't, you know. we don't get a lot of reminders of of the historical significance. A lot of people yeah. you know, parse it out politically, what he meant for the black community, whatever it may be. But like that day. Um, so how has the trend? Like it's always one of those things because you know everybody's transition out of the military is so different. And how's it been for you, especially going into Hollywood? Like it's a, it's not necessarily a stable career, right? Like it's not necessarily easy to you know just you know go work somewhere and and kind of have some routine. Like what, what's that, what's that experience well, been like for you? It's, it's been improbable. Uh, I'll say that, uh, one of, one of my, uh, trying, nah, I gotta like, I gotta like look at it cause I don't want to butcher it, you know, cause I, I'll flip a few words on it. But, uh, there's a quote from Barack Obama that kind of like sums it up uh, mm. for me, but. It's, uh, I never expected to be here. I always knew this journey was improbable. I've never been on a journey that wasn't. And, you know, for me, it, it takes a lot of conviction because, like you said, like this, this ain't a nine to five benefits and things like that. I mean, you're literally a private contractor for the most part and you're just jumping from project to project. And sometimes, you know, if you're lucky, the lucky ones, you can just, you know, either find, find one that starts up right after the one that you're on stops. Um, and if you ain't the, one of the lucky ones, like I've been for, for a while, you know, or, or, you know, for now, um, you get off a project and you can go like two years, you know, without, without finding the next one. So it was, it, you know, it's, it's been, it's, it's a hustle, it's a grind and it takes a lot of conviction to kind of be like, you know, I'm gonna stick it out. Um, but at the end of the day too, like not to say that other cats that have come out here and not, and, and done it and not been able to get traction, not to say that they didn't have conviction because at the end of the day, you got to pay the bills. And, and that was me last year, you know, like uh, it, it got to a point where it was just like, I just couldn't sustain it and I had to leave. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, you know, have, when you, when you say had to leave, leave what? <clears throat> I left, I left LA. Like I, like I said oh. earlier, I, I deployed, you know, not, not like, I mean, I kept my house, I kept my, my spot here, but it was, I, I couldn't like do anything here and, you know, couldn't get a job, couldn't find, couldn't find a thing. And I just went back to doing what I knew best. And that was, you know, mm -hmm. being a Marine. And so I, I took some orders and, and dipped out and I was just fortunate to, you know, so to have representation at the time. So while I was gone, they were still like putting me up for, for jobs and stuff. And I remember I had to like, you know, FaceTime in with uh, my showrunner, uh, Xander, Xander Lehman, who I will, I will go to the ends of the earth for Xander because he, he pulled me out of some, uh, some bad places, what, you know. What is back. a showrunner? I just learned what a showrunner is recently, but I'm sure a lot of people don't know what a showrunner is. I don't. Is. I don't know what a showrunner is. Uh, he's, uh, I mean, he or she, um, they, they're the person that kind of, uh, I think of a military term uh they're they're the general of of like a of the squad that is you know tasked with like creating a show for instance so you know mm -hmm. you've got you've got writers and they all kind of like rank out whether you know like a like a staff writer would be your private you know story editor is kind of like your corporal you know um so you know, all the way up to you know you got your eps and things like that so all the children kind of like who's running the whole thing and they're responsible for getting the scripts out. They're responsible for making sure, you know, we're coming in, uh, you know, at budget, 
um, they oversee everything from production to script. So it's like, you know, they, it's their show. And, 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 and most times the, the showrunner is the creator of the show. So it's like the person that came up with the concept, the idea, whether it's their life story or just, you know, some cool idea that they came up with. And, um, and so, you know, and so they're the person that I like, whose voice this, that the show needs to be and the, whose voice the, the show is. And, you know, and they're guiding us, you know, they, they got the show in whatever direction that we're going in. So, um, so, so he kept you connected while you were, while you were out. No, no, no. He gave me a job while I was out. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, my, my, my reps, they're the ones that were still like pushing me for stuff. And, and he read a script of mine, um, that eventually, uh, went to Sundance for, uh, you know, just recently, but, um, but yeah, so he read the script and he loved it. And he was like, hey, you know, like, I want you to be on the show. And they wanted to meet with me and I wasn't in town. And I had to, like, um, I had to Skype in on a call with him. And he's just like, yeah. And, and, like, and I'm all in, like, my uniform and stuff like that. And he's just like, yo, like, what? where are you? Is that, <laughs> is that, a, is that a helicopter behind you? Like, you should have just been on? like, I'm on set. I'm on set. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my reps told him. My reps are like, yo, he's, uh, he's kind of deployed right now. But, you know, we think he can be back for the show. Like, and that's because I told him, I was like, yo, look, I'll make it work. And, you know, the guy who I went to orders with, uh, it's my best friend. And, you know, I, I owe, I owe Polanco like my life, man. Like that dude, he's been there for me, like thick and thin. And so he knew my situation coming in and he was the one that kind of was like, Hey, look, I know you in the bind. Like, you know, we got this mission coming up, you know, we got to get this shit done. Like, Are you in? I'm like, I'm in. And, um, so, you know, when I told him, I was like, yo, I think I got this writing job on this show. He was like, hey, look, we'll, we'll make it work. We'll, you know, we'll cut your order short and we'll get you back out there. And, you know, wow. Cool. And how long were you, how, how long were you um, on the mission? Like, how uh, I, I was gone. I was gone for three months. Okay. But I, I would have been gone for eight, probably eight to 10 months had I, had yeah. I, had I not come back for the show. And, you know, who knows? Who knows at that point? Because then it's just like trying to like, you know, start back up a you know, an old machine, and it's just like you got to pay these bills, man, because things get crazy out here. What's that? Um, like the perception, the experience, whatever it is, leaving a mission early like that, um, like with the with the crew you were with, like how how did that all play out? No, they they were they were they were good to go with it, man. It's like That's cool. you know, uh, I think. Um, a, a lot of people in, in the military, um, you know, they, they use the military as either a springboard to kind of like help you get to like whatever, you know, the, the next step is. And some cats are like the career, you know, the career cats. So, um, you know, they, uh, you know, and, and everybody like, so I remember like a couple of them, they, they Googled me when I first came in because uh, most of the guys, they were like brand new to me and things like that. So like once little whispers kind of started, they were like, oh, wait, like who's, you know, you know who's, this, who's this guy? And it's like, oh, wait, like you, you got a picture next to, you know, Nathan Fillion and, you know, Ryan Reynolds and stuff like what's going on? So just kind of, you know, uh, they, they thought it was just like cool and stuff. And, and then once I left early to, you know, go right on the show, it's just like a lot of questions about like, you know, like how did you get into it? And I think it's just, it was just, you know, I think it's motivating um, and, and me not necessarily trying to be like, hey, you know what I'm saying? This is how you do it. But, you know, I think a lot of cats, um, when they're able to kind of see someone do something that they thought was, you know, unreachable or unattainable and just like seeing someone like really grind and, and kind of make it, you know, it's, it's like that old adage, you know, I mean, and, and riding those where it's just like, you know, you kind of see somebody make it out and you're just like, oh, shit, like it's, it's, it's more motivating than it is like, you know, fuck him. In Hollywood, do you do people want you to write? I don't know if people are asking you to write yet, but th in that military background, like kind of typecasting you a little bit because you're, you know, a black oh, yeah. at the end of the day, right? Uh, no, Hollywood likes to do that. I know. No, um, actually, that hasn't happened to me. Um, but and, and the crazy thing was like that was one of the things that I didn't want to happen. I was just like, look, I do, I don't want to be stereotyped as like, you know, the black writer who only, you know, is going to do like black stories. And I didn't want to be stereotyped as like the military writer who's only going to do like military stories. So mm. I always felt like I could, 
because I'm a fan of so much stuff, you know, like the, the mini series I'm doing for Netflix, it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a Japanese anime. Um, and like, I grew up on, you know, Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, you know, Bleach, uh, Full Metal Alchemist. Like I blew up, I, I grew up on Gundam Wing. Like I grew up Gundam. on Gundam. Oh, yeah. But, that yeah, was every morning that. before school. Yes. Man, um, it's a mobile suit. It's a Gundam! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dude, uh, so like you know, I'm a fan of Ghost that. Michelle, like, like Kira, yeah. like, you know, um, I you know my favorite movie is Predator. So like, I'm, I'm a huge fan of like just the genre space and sci-fi, um, and you know, so like for me, like I always wanted the projects that I that I do that kind of represent you know everything that I've you know watched and loved growing up, you know, and. And so, like, I write everything, and, and that's what I wanted to kind of like have. And, and and I know first starting out, people were just like, oh, well, you can't you can't just write everything. You gotta like, you know, be specific. You gotta like zero in on something. Da 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 da. Like, you gotta find your niche. And I'm like, no, why can't my niche just be everything? Like, I want to be, I want to be the guy where it's just like, you know, hey, you know, we're doing, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're doing this this you know this particular story. Like, let's let's call Nick Jones. You know, like yeah no matter what that story is, like, you can call me because it's like, oh, he's a good writer. Now, like, oh, well, we need a sci-fi writer, we need a John writer. It's just like, oh, we need, we need a writer. Oh, let's get Nick Jones, like, you know? And part of why I was writing so many scripts was because I wanted to show that, hey, I can write all of these different things. So I've got a script for every genre, every, you know, um, every tone, um, just to kind of be like, yo, like, you know, you think I can't do it, I'll do it. I'm writing this show for Netflix called Yasuke, um, and it's a story about um, this black samurai whose name was Yasuke, who grew up, uh, you know, back during feudal Japan um, time frame, and he uh, served under uh, this warlord named uh, Oda Nobunaga, and um, and so like the real life story of him, like he's he's a real guy, like you know he, you know, real historical figure, and the reason why he became this samurai was because this guy, Oda Nobunaga, he, uh, he had a lot of enemies and, you know, obviously because he was, you know, trying to take over and he couldn't trust a lot of people. Um, cause you know, they were sending assassins and things like that, spies, all that stuff. And the only person he could trust was this black man who wasn't from, wasn't from the, uh, the land because, you know, and he didn't even speak the language. And he was like, you know what? I know you're not going to try and fuck me over. He's like, you have no ties here. Yeah, so. you have no ties here. You ain't got no skin in the game. So, like, I'm going to make you a general. And he made him a, a samurai. So what we're doing is uh, we're going to do, like, this fantastical version of, of, of kind of, like, that story, but set 20 years after the known historical facts of him. And uh, we pick up with, you know, this retired Ronin who kind of gets called back in the service to, to transport this this, uh, this young girl. I'm who, already sold. Like, I'm in. Uh, I'm just I'm wanna, yeah, who he's dark want to take out yeah yeah but you know it, it should be dope it should be dope it's you know yeah uh LaShawn thomas he, he's directing from uh from boondocks you know, which is one of my, <laughs> yeah one of my favorite shows coming up and um and flying lotus is doing the music so i don't know if you guys are flying lotus fans but i don't know flying lotus oh, he's dope. Yeah, oh yeah look him up man he's dope he's dope flying lotus the name's dope yeah. now did you um is this one of those this isn't one of those things you wrote before and got picked up. It's some somebody who had the idea yeah. and said, you know, Nick Jones, I mean, this kind of goes back to the point of writing as much, um, as many different types of genres that you can and being a good writer. And then yeah. saying, and Nick Jones. Yeah, yeah. So it was, you know, it was that. Nick Jones and, Jr. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Don't forget the junior. Don't forget the junior. Uh, um, like, yeah, like Weezy F, Weezy F baby, don't forget the baby. Um, forget it. Forget it. <laughs> what was I gonna say? Um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was that. And also too, um, I gotta give credit to, um, you know, the, uh, the networking and just the, the relationship. So, uh, there was this lady who, um, uh, AC Bradley, who, uh, who I knew like two years prior and, um, I went in to meet with her to, to write on this show, Three Below, which is a spinoff from this other show. and But it's a spinoff from uh, Troll Hunters, which is uh, that's out now mm -hmm. on Netflix. And so I went in to write for Three Below, and I didn't get it. 
and she was just like, yeah, like I read your script, but you know, yeah, it, it wasn't the right tone for what we want to do. And I was like, yo, well, I can write that tone. And, um, and so that's when I started going on that blitzkrieg of like writing all these different scripts and tones and stuff. And so we ended up developing Jurassic World, um, um, this, uh, this Jurassic World project together. Um, and, um, and so she, in, in that process, we kind of reconnected. And um, so I think they reached out to her and she was like, no, like, you know, I'm, I'm not right for it, but I know somebody who is. And she kind of put me up for the project. That's cool. So, that, so then Netflix reached out to me. Uh, that's how you know they got my name. Netflix reached out to me, and um, I got a quick, <laughs> yeah. quick question. Right. So in in the in the process of writing, like all the kinds of stuff, what's the hardest thing? Like when you because you just mentioned tone. I imagine writing different characters. Like, what's the thing that allows you to write so many different genres? Is there one thing, or is it just for, for me, for me, it's just, you know, my my childhood and just being a fan of so many different things, man. Like, I can tell you, I, I was watching everything from, you know, like The Predator, which is my favorite movie, to The Lion King, you know. Um, and so I it's just... Lion King last night. Yeah, you know, so it's just like, it's just me and, and I have a bit of a photographic memory. So it's just like, I, I tend to like hold on to things, uh, you know, information, at least when it comes to movies and stuff a lot. And, you know, I can recite... You know, I tell I can recite every single line of Predator. Wow. Um, but um, but yeah, man, just you know, yeah, my childhood and just just being a fan of of of, of the art. Um, so you know, so you know all the different tones, and then now you can replicate them. Like you can make them your own in different yeah. stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, and, and and also too, just uh, and, and I would also say. That, like what helps with my dialogue anyway when I, when I write it's just just having lived a life and being around like a bunch of different people whether that's yeah. like growing up in the south or being in the military and it's just like being around cast that are from like west coast midwest east coast you know now living on the west coast you know traveling the world it's just I'm, I'm able I've been able to you know experience a lot of different cultures um and a lot of different people and, and I'm able to you know, put that into my stories we um so we had one of our guests he's um he he too is a writer mm -hmm. and he we talked about this idea of writing in diversity right because everybody's default is me mm -hmm. it's really default easy whiteness to, right <laughs> um do you find it easier given everything you just said about your experience everything that you've done your background to not default to any one thing, no, but whether whatever that may be, um, and giving you that ability to naturally just create a, a diverse landscape of people within all of your scripts. I mean, or do you have my, to make it a conscious effort? Well, I mean, my default is me, you know, yeah, like I so I grew up in a black household with a bunch of sisters, uh, you know, so it's just like my, my default is, is always going to be like, you know. The black experience um but i don't i don't have any trouble like trying to you know tell different stories because like i said you know it's just because like you said the maybe the industry default is white and those are like the movies that have kind of like taken the forefront for so many years you know leading up to now um you know i was yeah i was um exposed to that stuff obviously um but you know, being that, you know, I'm black, I was also exposed to like the stuff that, you know, the general public wasn't exposed to. So, like, you know, mm -hmm. whether whether that's, you know, whether that's movies like Boomerang or, you know, that like, everybody probably didn't watch, you know, or if, it, or if it's TV shows like, uh, you know, like Martin or, you know, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Hang on, Mr. Cooper, uh, you know, things like that. Um, man, there's there's another one that I want to live in, living single, which oh, you know, I watch. Yeah. yeah, you know, freaking, you know, uh, Friday, uh, you know, set it off. Like just you know, all those movies that I grew up, you know, on, and, and just you know, just being a part of that. You know, it's I think there, it, it it's not hard for me because I've seen so much of it and I've been exposed to so much of it that. Um, for me, it's just like just rolling through the Rolodex at times. And it's just like, hey, you know, what type of story do I want to tell now? You know, and is it going to be, you know, 
it's going to be this, you know, am I going to have, you know, these, you know, black leads, am I going to have, you know, white leads, it's going to be like co, like, you know, it, you know, for me, it's just like, what, what best suits the story. You know, we always like to ask at the end, if there's one thing that you want to leave our audience with, what, what would that one thing be? Oh man, that's, that's, I feel like I got to say something in depth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to. It's obviously a question incited to do so, yeah. but <laughs> you do not have to. I, I, I would say, you know, when when President Obama left office, you know, he told us to be, he he uh, he asked for us to kind of, you know, to uh, to be involved and be engaged in. Um, <clears throat> You know, from 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 every election to mayor, Congress, you know, dog catcher, like whatever the case may be, like to be involved in your community, because it all starts at the grassroots, and um, and that's something that I've tried to to, to do. Um, there was a guy running for mayor, you know, and I was like, all right, look, I'm, I'm gonna come out here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a part of this, you know, this speech is with him, um, you know, uh, I just went can canvassing. For, for the first time ever in my life, who would have thought that I'd be going door to door, like knocking on people's doors saying like, hey, make sure you get out and vote on Tuesday. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, um, and, you know, just, uh, you know, really, you know, taking that citizenship to heart um, because, you know, we have to make our voices heard in, in order for, you know, there to be, you know, the change that we need and, and the change that we want. Um, so, yeah, so it's just like, we just can't sit back and, you know, just and think that we don't, you know, our voice doesn't matter, our votes don't matter. Um, and so for me, I say vote. <laughs>